My name is Charles Gordon. Now, I am an American Negro, one of 20 million. I want to show you something of our life here. Everyone knows about the Negro musician or singer, but here is an example of something that perhaps you haven't seen. Here in an operating room in one of New York's hospitals, a man's life is at stake. The surgeons are all Negroes. For many years now, Negro physicians and surgeons have practiced their professions in hospitals throughout our country. There is great variety in Negro life. We do all kinds of work. We certainly aren't all surgeons. In fact, many of us still do lowly jobs. But let's go out to the part of the country where I come from, the Midwest. Here, many Negroes own their own farms. This farm has been in the family for three generations. In this art center here in Manhattan, a well-known dancer teaches a class in modern techniques. Here is a journalist who works for one of the many Negro-owned newspapers. More and more Negroes are becoming salesmen. For instance, this man sells cars. And here is a nursemaid. A bank teller. A draftsman. A machinist. A welder a diplomat. In a Park Avenue skyscraper, the vice president of a major corporation. To show you how many of us live, I'd like you to meet some friends of mine who live out in Brooklyn. This is Walter Beltrop. Sometimes on a Saturday night, if they can get a babysitter, Walter and I take our wives bowling. As you can imagine, Walter's a powerful bowler. He practically throws the ball down to the pin. Walter's wife, Wanzer, used to be a secretary. But Walter is a top-notch social worker. He works in a community center with young people. Tony's the oldest child. She already attends nursery school. She's three years old and has a great personality. This is Saturday morning. It's the morning that Walter always tries to help out around the house. Many American men like to do a little work around the house. Even I like to wash the dishes now and then. On this morning, Walter's going to help with the breakfast. His specialty is pancakes. Wanza thinks that Walter's pancakes are, are a little too crisp, but she tries to humor him. But Tony finds them very tasty. I'd like you to meet another family here in Brooklyn, the Smiths. Marvin Sr. is a parole officer. This is a very festive day, a very special day. Their two sons, age nine and seven, are excited as they await the arrival of the grandparents. Today is Thanksgiving.
Thanksgiving dinner is one of the great American customs. It's a day when families get together. On this day, it just wouldn't be right without a turkey. It's been a long day for Mrs. Smith, who was expecting a third child. Father says grace. And this is the important thing about Thanksgiving, to give thanks for the blessings of the year. To me, Thanksgiving is a day, thank you. It's a home, it's a home day. When you have a lovely home and then take somebody out to dinner on Thanksgiving day, no, something missing. In another part of town, at an old folks center, people of another generation are celebrating Thanksgiving too. This is Harlem. Harlem has always had the reputation of being a place of music, gaiety, and excitement. But to us, it has another meaning. Here, only Negroes live. How did this come about? The Negro was brought from Africa to be sold into slavery. A century ago, slavery was abolished. But a pattern of segregation took its place. Although there have been significant changes, we are still deprived in many instances of full rights and opportunities. For example, there are hospitals in which the surgeons we saw earlier are not allowed to practice. And in some states, we are still restricted by signs like these. Later in this film, we shall see some of the ways in which the situation is changing. But first, let us ask a cross-section of Negroes how segregation affects their lives. Segregation to the average Negro means being held back. He's looking for progress. He wants to move forward in the American mainstream. Segregation holds him back. I think it's uh, something that's ridiculous. You take the white people in the South that, uh, or not only in the South, anywhere, that refuses to allow a Negro man or a Negro woman to sit in a restaurant or to ride next to them in a bus or a train or anything. And then on the other hand, turns around and wants a colored woman to come into their home and cook their food and serve them uh, their dinner after having our hands all in their food. I think somebody's got to be crazy there. Up to this present time, it hasn't affected me at all. As far as... Uh, my work and my social activities, up until this present time, I can say it hasn't affected me. In order to understand how any Negro feels under segregation, you have to realize that from the time of infancy, he has it pounded into him that he's not as good as other people. There are things he cannot do. Don't do this, you can't do this, you can't do the other. It um, builds into a man a feeling of inferiority, a feeling of frustration, a feeling of resentment. So much bitterness built up in a person and resentment when you know that you're being segregated against simply because you're black and there's nothing that you can do about it. There is something you're trying to do about it. But. These students are typical of many throughout the country, both Negro and white, who have been effective in breaking the barriers of segregation. Sense the confidence and dedication of these young people as they discuss their plans talking about was the possibility of spending your Christmas in jail. I think the most beautiful thing that we could do would be to stage a mass sit-in or some type of demonstration and if they did not serve us to remain until they served us, if arrested to go in jail and refuse bail. That's what I think will um, have a, a much larger impact than just mere arrest. I'd like to hear your comments on it and see exactly what you think and how you feel about it. Tommy? We've been getting public sympathy, but not enough by just going in and coming out. And if we decide to spend Christmas in jail, then I'll go. That's all. How many people would actually feel committed enough right now that 
if it came to this, they would spend their time in jail over Christmas holidays. Through the years, Negroes have always protested against segregation. But what you see here is an example of a new spirit. In 1956, Negroes in Montgomery, Alabama, had come to the end of their patience with segregation. They refused any longer to sit in the back of buses, and in silent protest, chose to walk until all public transportation was desegregated. By this simple act, they seized the imagination of millions of Americans. The man who came to symbolize this movement and to give it a philosophy was the Reverend Martin Luther King. He preached nonviolence as the means for Negroes to attain their rights. These were the principles of Mahatma Gandhi. Nonviolence proved successful, and the buses of Montgomery were desegregated. One of the most dramatic applications of the principles of nonviolence came with the Freedom Rides. These were organized by the Congress of Racial Equality, whose members, both Negro and white, determined to challenge the practice of providing separate facilities for Negro and white travelers in the South. From all over the country, mixed groups traveling by bus entered the South. They entered segregated waiting rooms and restaurants in many Southern cities. In some, they were arrested, but they were determined to succeed even if it meant going to jail. Negroes were jailed for entering white waiting rooms. Whites were jailed for entering Negro waiting rooms. Over 300 Freedom Riders went to jail. Nearly half of those were white. Nearly half were women. Once again, the principles of nonviolence proved their effectiveness. For an evaluation of the Freedom Rides, we asked James Farmer, National Director of the Congress of Racial Equality. Rarely in American history has anything been so successful as the Freedom Riders in the attack upon segregation. Before the Freedom Rides began, most of the bus terminals were segregated, especially in the Deep South. But as a result of the Freedom Rides, the Interstate Commerce Commission issued a ruling which went into effect on November 1st, ordering that all the segregation signs must come down in the terminals and that in their place must be posted desegregation signs. How is it that these events had not taken place earlier? We asked Roy Wilkins, Executive Secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Well, of course, for many years, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the declarations therein were on the side of minorities and individual freedom, but the enforcement of the law was not. However, over the years, the Supreme Court has handed down a number of decisions in voting rights, and matter of service on juries, in housing, and in education, uh, which have given the federal government the power to proceed. Now, these decisions were won uh, largely, but not exclusively, by NAACP attorneys. With uh, the legal framework now firmly in hand, the federal government is free to proceed and act uh, to enforce the rights of its citizens. Shortly after the war, President Truman ordered segregation to be ended in the armed forces. However, because of the nature of our Constitution, the president cannot just do away with segregation by a stroke of the pen. But through the actions of the federal government, state governments, organizations, and individuals, progress has been made in a number of areas. Let's have a look at three of these, voting, housing, and education. First, voting. Here is Robert Kennedy, the attorney general, speaking to the press on this question. Uh, we have found a, a pattern of discrimination in uh, some sections of the United States which have used uh, literacy tests uh, to uh, uh, deprive uh, really tens of thousands of, uh, uh, of our citizens the right to vote because of their color. This, uh, this uh, legislation will uh, rectify that situation. Ralph Metcalf, a Chicago alderman on the Negro's power as a voter. Well, I would say that the power of the Negro vote is increasing by each election because the Negro now is becoming more aware 
of his position in the electoral field as a result of many of the things that are happening today. And I think he's been being more discriminating in his voting. He's being acutely aware of those candidates who he thinks will espouse his own cause and therefore votes in larger numbers now. In some cases, the Negro's vote is crucial and often carries the balance of power. As a result, more and more Negroes are running for political office in the United States. The Constitution stands for, and we as taxpayers demand. I'm delighted to be on what I think is one of the finest tickets that's been offered to our state for many years. Progress in voting has been reflected in other areas. Let's take a look at housing. In this Chicago suburb, Negroes and whites live side by side. But for many Negroes, housing remains a problem. Whitney Young, national director of the Urban League, discusses this. So many Negroes do live in substandard housing and slum housing, uh, dilapidated housing, and it does affect the whole family constellation. It's hard to keep a husband and children in an overcrowded housing situation. It is no secret that in this country there is a disproportionate number of Negro citizens who are on the welfare rolls, a disproportionate amount of total social disorganization. Although many Negroes still live in substandard housing, there has been a tremendous movement into better homes. To facilitate this, several states have passed laws prohibiting discrimination in housing. And recently, the president signed an order prohibiting discrimination in housing built with federal support. Most Negroes, the most important progress has been in the field of education. This is Little Rock, Arkansas, 1957, when Negro students encountered violence in their attempt to register at a previously all-white school. Traditionally in the South, schools had been segregated. So it is not surprising that there was opposition when the Supreme Court ordered schools to integrate. But violence could not be tolerated. President Eisenhower ordered in federal troops to support the rights of the Negro student. To the eyes of the world, the fact of violence tended to obscure the true meaning of Little Rock. Its importance was that it demonstrated to those who opposed integration that they would ultimately have to give way. Negroes' rights would be upheld by the federal government. Eventually, these students were admitted, educated, and graduated. Today in Little Rock, this school is peacefully integrated. Year by year, integration of schools has proceeded, but there have been some holdouts. One of these was the University of Mississippi. In 1962, the Little Rock story was repeated there when President Kennedy sent in federal troops to ensure James Meredith's right to enroll and to pursue his studies. In many areas of our country, schools have never been segregated. For example, I went to integrated schools all my life. This is one of the high schools in the part of the country where I spent my youth, Indiana. Here the students come to school at seven in the morning. Already the basketball team is practicing. The team is composed of both Negroes and whites. He kicked it out. It's Green's ball, boys. Let's get hustle down. That's the way to handle it, Willie. Gray a little tighter defensively. Get up on him. Move it. Move it. Swing it around. Somebody got to get on time. Get out there. Help. Help, Ben. Help. We asked the principal to tell us about his school. In this school, we have about 10% of Negro students. Now, we have no problem, really, uh, racially at Washington, and I think principally because the students are very clever and very able in handling their problems. There is no conflict. It's a completely integrated school insofar as school activities are concerned, both curricular activities and extracurricular find the people completely mixed and working without reference to color. The administrative policy and the teacher's activities, the student's point of view, uh, sees no color. We treat everyone insofar as possible uh, as an individual and on the basis of his own merits. 
William Forrest teaches social studies. We asked him whether his students discuss race relations freely with him. Oh, uh, very easily. In fact, this is probably one of their my main concerns. Many times they see something in the paper or in a magazine. They always ask me, well, how do you feel about this? And uh, what's your impression? And what are the real circumstances behind these situations? Sometimes we step on a few toes, and I think we have to, some basic beliefs and concepts that probably mom or dad or a grandparent had. And uh, perhaps they even believe this themselves until they get involved in the situation where the facts are put forth and they can realize for themselves that perhaps mom and dad have been wrong. I think this is a really true building step toward better race relationships. As you have seen, although we in America have some way to go in improving race relations, we have already come a long way. How do we Negroes feel about ourselves and our country? I think that uh, much of the change in the Negro's feeling about himself uh, has been brought about as a result of the newly developed countries of Africa. Uh, I think that many of us are very proud now of our African heritage. I think black has come to be uh, something that we're all quite proud of. I say America because this is the only country that I know. It's the country that I have fought in wars to defend because its principles, I believe, and because it provides me the opportunity to fight for the things I believe in. The vast majority of Negroes feel this way, that there is nothing wrong with the United States or our democracy that we can't correct. Uh, there is always that hope, that strong feeling that we can correct the situation. Uh, if we can pull a few of these knuckleheads together and bump their heads and make them understand that this is what was meant as the American ideal. This is my home. And though in many instances it has caused me pain, I am first of all an American. I think that there are many indications of extreme tension which produce hostility. The Meredith case at the University of Mississippi is probably the best example of this. It's been a long time since we've had anything that was this violent, this upsetting. But I think that this is because on the whole things are improving but moreover, everybody knows that things have to improve. By and large, the 20 million Negroes in the United States work and play just as any other American does. Of course, the pursuit of equal rights is uppermost in all our minds. We know that the responsibility of being an American is part of that pursuit. But in terms of everyday living, what we basically enjoy is pretty much what every American enjoys. The long and heroic struggle of Negro and white alike against the evils of race prejudice is one of the greatest epochs in our nation's history. It has brought the American Negro to real heights of heroism and splendid achievement. We have broken many shackles and won our way to the front lines of our national, artistic, athletic, and intellectual endeavor. We have become a vital factor in industry, agriculture, and are a decisive force in our general political life. We have truly in the United States come a long way, but we still have a good way to go.